we are ready to start today. Today we are attending the last lecture given by Bridgely Ame. The topic is Advanced Control of Wearable Robotic Exoskeleton. So please give a, a strong applause for Bridgely Ame. Okay, so uh, thank you and uh, good morning everybody. Let's start so the last lecture and hope that you enjoyed all the lectures. So today I will try to talk about another topic, so another application of automatic control in robotics. And today the idea is to talk about wearable robotics. So wearable robotics, wearable is coming from wear, to wear something, like the suits for instance. And actually, wearable robotics is a new research domain. It has started few, some years ago, but it was uh, specific for some applications, mainly military applications. But actually, this domain is going fa very, very fast, and it was extended to many other applications. So today, I will try to talk about this research domain. And for sure, I will focus the presentation on the aspects concerning the control. Control of this kind of mechanical devices used as wearable robots. So, uh, I think that I will go very uh, fast on the first part since you were here at the previous lectures, presenting my lab in Montpellier. Uh, five research teams in our lab, medical robotics, industrial robotics, humanoid robotics, here uh, vision, and here uh, exoskeletons, and uh, mobile robots. So these are different research teams. And actually we have also uh, different experimental platforms developed in our lab and used also for the validation of our, our, of our research. Now, concerning my research activities, as I said in the previous lectures, I'm working on <coughs> robot control with uh, different applications. And today, I will try to focus the presentation on this kind of robotic devices. So it's uh, what we call the exoskeleton. Now, this is the outline of the presentation. So mainly, the main points are the following. So we will start with a general introduction of exoskeletons, just to see one example of application where we use these exoskeletons and to understand also the challenges. Then I will go the, to the definitions. So I will give you some very basic definitions, very simple, to understand what is an exoskeleton and where we can use an exoskeleton. Uh, then I will introduce a, a brief ha a historical overview where I will talk about the origin of the exoskeleton. So it's just a brief historical overview, it's not very detailed, but in the end of this overview, I will show you a video that will show you very new exoskeletons developed these last years, and also I will talk about 12, I will show you 12 uh, exoskeletons that has been commercialized in, two, in 2015. Then I will present our experimental platform, so we have two exoskeletons used to validate the proposed control schemes. The first one is the IcoZ, and the second one is the AeroWall. Then the proposed control solutions that will be presented very briefly, I will just deta detail them, but I will uh, focus more on some simulation results. You know we can do simulation before you apply what you develop on a real robot, you can do simulation using any simulation language like MATLAB or C++ or any language, and then I will show some real-time experimental results and I will conclude the presentation. Actually, let me start with the introduction and let me show you this small video concerning exoskeletons. For example, currently being used in research and clinical trials, including the EXO by Exobionics, Indigo by Parker Hansen, Rewalk by Argo Medical, and Rex by Rex Bionics. These devices offer upright mobility. 
here you can see you can see the application. So this is just a website where you can find more information about these exoskeletons. Anyway, so this is just to introduce this concept as you have seen the medical application where we can use an exoskeleton to help humans to restore some lost motion or for paraplegic or for elderly persons, for all these kind of applications. So we can use exoskeletons. But now, before we go further, let me introduce some basic definitions to understand what is an exoskeleton and where we can use it and what are the challenges related to design and control of such systems. First of all, what is an exoskeleton? So before we introduce the definition of an exoskeleton, we can see here on these two pictures a common point between animals and humans. So animals and humans, so we have what we call skeletons inside our body. So a skeleton, it's a structure inside body, and the idea of the structure inside body, which is rigid, so it's to protect and support the inner working of the body. So this is the objective of, an, of a skeleton inside the body, and to be able to move, so we have the muscles which are attached to this skeleton inside to be able to move the body. And these skeletons which are inside the body, we call them endoskeleton, inside the body, endoskeleton. Now, let's have a look to other examples of animals which are very different from humans and from this kind of animals. So we can find this kind of animals that you know perfectly. For this kind of animals, they have and outside, something that protects the body, okay? So they have a skeleton outside of their body. So it's not inside, but outside of the body. And if it is outside, so we call it exoskeleton. So the first example is endoskeleton inside the body. And for this example, it's outside the body, and we call it exoskeleton. And you can find many examples of insects, spiders, shrimps, crabs, etc. Et et so we have many examples. Now I can ask you just a very simple question. Can anyone give me an example of one animal that has both endo and exoskeleton? The? The? Nice, very nice. So the turtle is a specific case where we have the animal with endo and exoskeleton. Anyway, now let's see the skeleton or the exoskeletons in robotics. What is an exoskeleton in robotics? So in robotics, it's a mechanical frame, it's a mechanical frame designed to be worn by human. So this uh, mechanical device or this frame should be worn by the human. So it should be designed around the function and the shape of the human, of the human body. So we can imagine that you have here the human body, so we have to design some, something that will fit with the human body. So this is the mechanical structure, and the human body will wear this structure. So we obtain this. So here you have the human, you have the structure, and you have the human wearing this structure. And why now we design this, or we, why we work on this exoskeletons, what is the idea? The idea behind this is that the wearer or the human that wears the exoskeleton will move, so we move, and the structure will move with the wearer. And uh, for two principal uh, objectives, adding strength and durability. And sometimes restoring some motions for these, the paralyzed persons, for instance, you can restore motion by adding this structure. So this is the idea. This additional strength, protection, support, benefits the people in 
dangerous situations to protect the body, or in tiring jobs also. For tiring jobs, this structure can help the body to do the work and to avoid tiring. And also for mobility issues, this is for paralyzed persons to restore some motions or some mobility degrees. Initially, the exoskeletons were, were developed for military applications. But actually nowadays, it was, as I said, expanded in a very large way, such that we have many other examples. Okay, so this is just the first basic definition of exoskeleton. Now, where an exoskeleton is used, or where we can use an exoskeleton? So, the we have some main applications, and the first one is medical applications. And for medical applications, the idea, the idea is to design assistive devices, to assist assistive devices in physical therapy, for instance, in rehabilitation. You have a problem with your knee, you go to see a doctor, and the doctor has to do, to do this rehabilitation motion for one hour, so it's very, perhaps, tiring for the doctor. What we can do, we can replace the doctor by this exoskeleton that you have to wear, and the doctor has just to push a button, and the exoskeleton will help you to do this rehabilitation. So this is an example of medical application where we use an exoskeleton. Or to restore locomotion. So if you have paralyzed persons, uh, to restore some motion, so we can use also the exoskeletons, and in this case, we can call the we can talk about the augmented human. So we augment the human by adding these parts to restore some mobility. Some examples for these medical applications, as you can see here in the first example, it's a rehabilitation exoskeleton for the upper body, for the hand or the arm or the arm. So for the arm, you can use this, for instance, and, it, and the doctor will ask you to do some specific motions for different situations where uh, the exoskeleton will be passive or semi-passive or completely active or something like that, so to do this rehabilitation. We can find other examples for uh, lower limbs, for instance, for walking, as you can see through these two examples. We can also design some exoskeletons, as you can see here, for both. We can see this mechanical structure. For the rehabilitation of the hand, not the arm, but the hand, I mean the fingers and so on, we can use uh, some exoskeletons like this example. And also we can have other examples for walking rehabilitation, but they are different from the two previous ones in such a way that they are here static and here they are mobile. So you wear them and you walk, okay? The first two examples. And here you walk, but the whole system will not move. It stays in the place because it's a very big structure as you can see here. So this is the first application of exoskeletons, medical application. Another example, or other examples, another application, it's for consumer or civilian application. So this is mainly for elderly persons, for instance. They have uh, perhaps not very powerful muscles because of the age. So to help them, we can use exoskeleton. So in this case, you can buy some exoskeletons where you can use them at home to perform your daily tasks, for instance, or any motions. Here you have three examples. Uh, maybe as you can see for the three examples, these exoskeletons are lightweight. For instance, this first example, Al, uh, the weight is only 10 kilograms. Only 10 kilograms. And you can buy it, actually, it is commercialized and you can use it for any tasks at home to lift uh, um, some objects or to help elderly persons to walk or to do some exercises. Another application now, it's for work or industry applications. So also for some workers in the industry, so they perform a very hard work, so they need the help to avoid tiring, to avoid problems with the body, with the back and so on. So in this case also we can use these exoskeletons to ease or to help for physical exertions in industry, to multiply the force or the strength of the user, of the human, to distribute its own, and the, uh, its own load and the carried load, and to reduce the user's strength. Some examples, three examples as you can see here. An example, first one here as you can see, in for, uh, any manufacturer, if you have to do this 
physical uh, tasks, you can use these exoskeletons. This is coming from Daewoo, the manufacturer of cars from Korea, for instance, and as you can see, it can help the worker to carry heavy loads. And third example is coming from Ford, the American manufacturer of cars also, for different tasks here in the company of manufacturing of cars. So for all these examples, the exoskeleton is used to help the human, to help the worker to do hard work or to do hard tasks. So this is the third application, and I will show you the fourth application, and it was the original one, so military applications. And military applications, it's like for the industrial applications, it's to amplify the strength, the duration, the enduration, or the strength of the, uh, of the, of the persons, uh, military persons, soldiers. And here we have two examples. Uh, the first one and the second one is Exos coming from Sarcos, and the idea is the same, to increase the powerful, the strength, the endurance, and sometimes the precision also. The precision for shooting, you can use an exoskeleton to have a very nice precision to avoid this vibration or this tremor motions uh, in the case of the human. So these are the four examples where we can use exoskeletons. Now, let me just give you to summarize what I have just uh, said just now. To summarize, so if you do classification of exoskeletons, we can use this classification from this reference. So exoskeletons can be classified in two classes. So we have the medical and non-medical. For the case of medical, we have different applications, different specific applications. For instance, for paraplegics, for rehabilitation, for amputee or disabled persons, okay, to restore motion, and for compensation. And the non-medical case, or non-medical task, in this case, so for soldiers, so this is a military application, for workers in industry, for healthy elderly persons, to help them at home, and for general purpose also. So this is just to summarize what I just talked about here. Now, uh, we have also different kinds of exoskeletons in two manners. First one is, if we look to the mobility of the device, so we have two kinds, so we have stationary and mobile. Stationary, it means that the structure of the exoskeleton will not move, it will stay in the same place. And mobile, it means that the exoskeleton will move, okay? So this is two kinds. And also, uh, depends on the, on the objective of developing of the exoskeletons, we have two kinds depending on the body. If we use the exoskeleton for the lower limbs, so lower body, we have lower body exoskeleton. If you use the exoskeleton for, for the upper body, for the arms, for the hands, for the head, and so on, this is what we call upper body exoskeleton. So, regarding to this, we can see that we have four examples, or four different examples. The first one here, as you can see, it's lower limbs, which is a stationary. The second example, it's uh, lower limbs also, but here it's mobile. So when the human will use this, will move, so he will move with the exoskeleton. Now for the, uh, for the upper body, as you can see here, an example for the rehabilitation of the arm, which is here, and, the, and it is a stationary uh, device. And here, it's the same, it's for the hand, for the arm, but it's mobile. So the wheeler can move with the exoskeleton. And depending on your application, where you want to use the exoskeleton, what is the objective, what you want to do with, so you can choose one exoskeleton or another. For instance, if you are a doctor, you want to do a rehabilitation, you can use this one, perhaps it's more performance than this one. But if you are a user at home, you want to restore emotion, or you want to do something, so you need this one, not this one, because you have to do some activities at home, and you need to have this motion, so this one is much better than this one, for instance. So depending on the application, you have to choose the right exoskeleton. Now, let's talk about control. Now, control an exoskeleton, it's not a very easy task. I explain why. Uh, an exoskeleton, as I said, it's uh, something that a human should wear, so we, when we talk about control, so we try to control this mechanical structure or this mechanical frame, but we have to pay attention to many things because this frame will be worn by the human. 
Now, to control, we have to consider first the model, for instance, of the exoskeleton, the dynamic model, the mathematical model, how it will move, how it is actuated, like any robot. All what we have said the, during the last lectures regarding robotics, control, and so on, we have to take this into account for exoskeletons also. The controller design, the actuators, the saturation of the actuators, the, uh, the task that you want to do, the performance, the robustness, and so on. So this is one thing. And the other thing, we have to add the human, because when you move an exoskeleton, when you move a robot, the robot is alone, but when the exoskeleton is worn by the human, you move the exoskeleton, you will move the human with. So you have to pay attention twice, because also of the security uh, aspects. So as you can see here for the controller, we have here a high level control, the middle level control, and low level control. The low level control, it's on, on the, mainly on the actuator, the motors and so on. And for the high level, it's the what you want to do. I will want to do a task, I need to have a perception to see something, to the perception of the environment, and I want to repeat the motion for rehabilitation, for instance. All these aspects should be taken into account in the high level. And the middle level is the translation layer between the high level and low level. Here, as you can see, we have the user, and here we have the exoskeleton. And as you can see, the three blocks, we have the problem of safety. So if you are working on a classical robot manipulator, for all the cases, the industrial robots are all the time 100% away from human, okay? From now, yes, these last, uh, these last years, we can start talking about collaboration between human and robot, but till now, industrial robots were away. I mean, you use an industrial robot, you put it here, you have to prohibit humans to be near the robot. So if there is a problem on the robot, so the sa I mean, what I mean is the safety regarding an industrial robot alone and the safety regarding a mechanical structure that should be worn by human, it's completely different. It's, uh, I mean, for the case of the human, you have to pay attention regarding this uh, security. And also when you develop something, pay attention. It's not very easy to say, yes, I will try what I developed on human. Before you can try on a human, you have to guarantee all the aspects of the security and you will not uh, do any harm to the human. So this is very important. Uh, now, let me introduce the historical overview of the exoskeletons. So exoskeletons, as you can see, it's, an, it's a new research field, but the origin of this research field is very, very old. Even if they have been, at the beginning, just some drawing, some design, without any construction of the exoskeleton. So the first exoskeleton in the world was designed, just designed, in 1890. So this is the system, as you can see, and it is just a very simple system to help the human for walking. And it was just concept studies, just drawing, so it was not constructed at that time. Then, in 1960, so we have this exoskeleton that was constructed, so it's a real exoskeleton with actuators, with sensors, so but it has 68 kilograms. So the weight of the exoskeleton is 68, and it has 30 degrees of freedom for the motion. So it's very, very powerful, and it can, it is a fully body hydraulically powered, so the actuators, I had hydraulic actuators, so it has a very high powerful. And it can amplify drastically the human force. So this was in 1960. Another example in 1971, you, as you can see, it's very different from the previous one, such that this new one in 1971, it's very lightweight. Regarding the other one, the weight here is re completely reduced or drastically reduced. So it is actuated with pneumatic actuators and it has flexion extension, so flexion extension in three degrees of freedom, so the hip, the knee, and the ankle. It means here, here, and here, so we have flexion extension two and two and two, you have six degrees of freedom. And also you have the abduction, abduction of the hip, so this motion. Now, in 2004, many other examples, uh, just to remark the previous uh, two examples, so the power is coming from outside, so you need to have a wire or cable that relates the origin of power to the actuators. Actually, here it was one of the first exoskeletons 
autonomous. So everything is embedded and the exoskeleton we use batteries here that can give the power to the motors. So this exoskeleton was uh, developed within the DARPA program and it was developed at, at Berkeley. The name of the exoskeleton is called Blix and it has seven degrees of freedom per leg. So three degrees of freedom here on the hip, one degree of freedom in the knee, and three degrees of freedom in the ankle. So we have seven degrees of freedom, but only four degrees of freedom are actuated with motors. So the four degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom here, one here and one here, they are actuated by motors. And uh, it was uh, using a linear hydraulic actuators for this prototype. Other examples, in 2006, we have this example, it's uh, for military applications, it's called exhaust suit, and it can amplify the power or the strength of the human by 25. And in this case also the power is coming from outside, so it's a tethered uh, exoskeleton. It weighs 68 kilograms, and it allows the user to handle up to 90 kilograms of payload. Another example in 2011, this is the Rework exoskeleton, and this is a very nice one. Why? Because it's uh, lightweight. It is for disabled persons. It uses DC motors at the joints, and it uses also batteries to, 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 to give the power to the actuators. And this exoskeleton, since it was developed for, uh, for disabled persons, so it has a very nice benefits. At the same time, physiological, and psychological. If you imagine a person that has never walked during his life, and you give him a tool that will help him to walk, when he walks, it will be really magic for him. So it can bring a, a very, very nice psychological benefit. Another example now, it's the example uh, of Al, and also this exoskeleton actually is commercialized, and they designed, it was designed in Japan, and they designed different uh, versions, so AL, AL3, AL5. Five, it means five degrees of freedom actuated, and it was designed to support and expand the physical capabilities of the user, of the human, for people with physical disabilities, and it allow, as you can see on the picture here, to carry loads, and the advantage is that it weighs only 10 kilograms. So if you go back, to the first exoskeleton in 1960 or 61, around 68, uh, how much it was, 68 kilograms, this one, between 68 kilograms and the last one here, 10 kilograms, you can see the difference. So we divided the weight by 68. In, you can also confuse the number of years, so the first one it was in 60 and in 2012. Anyway, now let me show you other examples of exoskeletons that you can buy. Actually, so the, so there has been a huge development regarding exoskeletons in different aspects. I mean, in the research labs, in the universities, in research centers, in the industry, and so on. But actually, not all the exoskeletons have been commercialized. Let me show you 12 examples that was commercialized in 2015. Here is the 12, uh, actual, uh, 12 exoskeletons commercialized. Here is the web page where you can find them with more details and they will introduce them. So the first one, we have seen, we will see it also in the video later on. It's the exoskeleton rework. And also, very nice one, very nice design, very lightweight and for disabled persons. We have exo, also, for lower limbs. We have the example of indigo, and we have the example of Rex. All of them are exoskeletons for lower limbs. Other examples, as you can see this one for walking also. It's Lokomat, we have the example of Al, what we have seen, only 10 kilograms. Honda, so the manufacturer of cars, we have seen in the lecture concerning humanoid robots that they have developed a very nice humanoid robot called Zemo, that we have seen on the videos. So they develop also this exoskeleton called Walking assist. Another example, this is a French exoskeleton, it's called Hercule. And Hercule, it was developed by the company Air B3D, and this is collaboration with the 
with research uh, institution also. And as you can see, uh, it can help workers to carry loads and also for other applications. And this is actually commercialized. The ninth example is coming from Daewoo to help workers also. So this prototype or this, uh, this exoskeleton is commercialized. Another example, it's, which is here from Russia, exoathlete. And as you can see also, it's a lower limb exoskeleton. For workers, we have horses. And the last one, a gainer for ski. So all this uh, is just some examples of the exoskeletons that have been commercialized in two, starting from 2015. Now let me show you a video to have an idea about this new technology this is today. Kratos, a giant robotic exoskeleton prowling the streets of Tokyo. And this amazing device actually allows paraplegics to walk. <laughs> you see how it works. So 10 examples in a video. Rewalk. This is the one. take it for granted, the act of walking is an elusive dream for those with spinal cord injuries. Thanks to Rewalk Robotics, Rewalk Exoskeleton, many who had no hope of ever standing How it could be used? on their feet and walking. How Rewalk is strapped onto the legs and torso. How you can fix it on the body? How you have some control users are generally the able to stand without assistance. When the user's upper body is tilted forward, Rewalk's motors respond by initiating a forward step. Repeating this motion causes Rewalk to generate a sequence of steps that mimics natural walking. With handheld canes strapped to the forearms for balancing, Rewalk allows many users to stand on their own. The most widely known powered walk assist device, Rewalk has been approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for home and community use. Nice. Rex. Another company that has created an advanced, life-changing exoskeleton is New Zealand's Rex Robotics. Oh, New this Zealand. is their Rex walking device, yes. a product they believe will help certain wheelchair users who can operate hand controls achieve far more freedom and upright mobility. Self-supporting and controlled by the user, Rex can help paraplegics stand, walk, and move around with both legs. Suitable for a wide range of uses, Rex can also help get convalescing patients back on their feet. Physiotherapists and Rex Bionics are developing robot-assisted physiotherapy. Using Rex, patients are able to attain an upright position, allowing them to participate in a series of robot-supported exercises. Also envisioned for home and work use, the Rex robotic device is a positive step in the right direction. The eighth one for children. For children with spinal muscular atrophy, life is a challenge. Developing muscle weakness between the ages of six and 12 months, these children often cannot stand or walk without help. The Spanish National Research Council has introduced okay. an exoskeleton for these children that will help them walk for up to five hours. Still in the preclinical phase, five the hours. hope to make it available to medical facilities. Made for children between the ages of 3 and 14, this 26-pound device consists of support rods which fit around the user's legs and torso that can be adjusted as the child grows. With five motors in each leg that mimic human muscles, the model includes intelligence joints, which adapt to the symptoms of each child by automatically altering the brace's rigidity. Helping children with SMA stay active and avoid further complications from immobility make this a worthy and wonderful invention. One. Panasonic believes in eliminating physical barriers created by age, sex, and strength. Recently, their satellite company ActiveLink has created a new power assist suit, the Ninja, or Ninja. Or PLM31. This innovative exoskeleton is designed to lighten the load on any worker. An upgraded version of the Ninja lower body suit, the PLM31 adds power to both the upper and lower body, making any task easier, regardless of physical strength. Worn by a member of the pit crew in 2015, so, Suzuka for upper and lower legs. the Ninja more than proved its worth. The company hopes to have the power assist suit available by 2017. ActiveLink has also developed the Mighty MS2 Power Loader, a mega suit that can be used during disaster relief, construction, and public works. These powerful exoskeletons are paving the way for a more productive future for everyone. Sixth one. From Hyundai. Not to be outdone by its Japanese counterparts, South Korean automaking giant Hyundai is developing its own top-looking robotic exoskeleton, the H-Lex. Aimed at the transportation, industrial, and military markets, this suit will allow users to lift and manipulate objects weighing over 132 pounds, with no stress on the legs, arms, or back. 
The wearer straps in and controls the suit with normal body movements. Special hand controls provide grip and lift capability with a pair of grasping claws. Another version has been shown which appears to assist leg mobility only. If appearances mean anything, the H-Lex exoskeleton will be an impressive piece of gear. Hit point. If you run across this innocent looking young lady on the streets of Tokyo, you might want to steer clear, especially if she is wearing the Power Jacket MK3 from Sakawai Electronics. This poor gentleman, it seems, found that out the hard way. Originally created as a publicity stunt for a Japanese cartoon, the MK3 is all too real. Hands are placed on levers in its long arms, with the feet resting on two pedals inside the legs of its carbon fiber and aluminum frame. Its electronically controlled motors enhance the user's movements while walking, or when sprinting like a ninja. Stability is provided by an onboard motion slave system. Sagawa Electronics only produced five MK3s, which might not be such a bad thing. One point. S. Imagine yourself piloting a terrifying giant agent of destruction through the streets of Tokyo, defending the Earth against alien robotic invaders. Aliens aside, such a war machine actually exists in the form of this four-ton mega machine, Kiratas. This 13-foot monster of mayhem is capable of moving at 10 kilometers per hour. Kiratas is operated by a pilot from the inside or driven by remote control. Its giant hydraulic arms look ready to tear to shreds anything that stands in its opposition. The cockpit features full video display and touch panel controls. Kiratas can be outfitted with several weapons, including two Gatling guns that can fire 6,000 BBs per minute, and a low-cost launcher loaded with water bottles. Auto alignment allows the pilot to lock onto any target, and the smile shot feature actually fires the Gatling guns when the pilot smiles. Let's just hope that pilot doesn't start enjoying it too much. In addition to gaining millions of civilian fans around the world, the Iron Man movies have apparently caught the attention of the United States military. They've been testing the XOS2 powered exoskeleton from Raytheon and its subsidiary Sarcos. In the field, this Iron Man inspired creation can turn regular soldiers into something akin to Superman. The XOS2 does the lifting for its operator, reducing both strain and exertion. It will also enable users to work much faster. According to the creators, one operator in an exoskeleton suit can do the work of two to three soldiers, allowing military personnel to be assigned more important tasks. Powered by high-pressure hydraulics, the XOS2 employs a number of sensors, actuators, and controllers. Users can easily lift 200 pounds repeatedly without fatigue. Yet with all its strength, the XOS2 is extremely agile allowing for more delicate movements like kicking a soccer ball or climbing stairs. No matter what the task, soldiers wearing the XOS2 will be far more capable. Ultimate Weapons Master, an entirely new form of combat sport, has burst onto the scene featuring real fighters wearing an advanced exoskeleton armor suit called the Lorica. The Lorica suit, which features enhanced levels of protection, is also capable of measuring and recording strikes to the armor from weapons, kicks, and punches. Scores are then processed in real time based on damage that would have occurred to an unprotected fighter's body. The damage is then displayed both on monitors and with LEDs on the suit. Viewers can experience combat from the fighter's perspective through helmet cameras, as well as listen to the sounds of combat through microphones embedded in the Lorica suit. Fighters engage in real martial arts style combat in matches which are broadcast on UMW's website. Made possible by advancements in exoskeleton technology, this sport could become wildly popular. And the last one. Okay. As advanced as the world of virtual reality has become, the one thing that has generally been missing is the ability to touch and feel objects. Seattle-based Axon VR believes they are close to making this dream a reality with the Axon gaming suit and platform. When immersed within the Axon system, if you touch or pick up a virtual object, you'll actually feel it against your hand and be able to tell if it's hot or cold, round or square. You'll feel your footsteps as they touch the ground, even though you are suspended in the air by the Axon station. The ability to feel your virtual surroundings is made possible through many small tactile and temperature sensors located all throughout the suit. The suit will include a jacket, pants, gloves, and boots, and will be used with a virtual reality headset. Axon's VR is still developing this innovation, but once perfected, the possibilities for use are astounding. Nice.
Actually, so just some examples. You have seen different kind of exoskeletons for different applications where we can use them. So they're powerful what, and what they can bring for human. Uh, now let me show you uh, just uh, two examples of prototypes on which we are working in our lab. Actually, uh, these two exoskeletons, the first one is the ACOS exoskeletons, and ACOS is coming from exoskeleton intelligent communicating and sensitive to intention. So the idea was develop, to develop this exoskeleton for the problems with the knee, for the rehabilitation of the knee, and the idea also, as you can see here, sensitive to intention, is to use some sensors that you can put on the muscles of the human, EMG sensors, such that we can help the human to do a task, for instance, either for rehabilitation or for the elderly persons. So this prototype was developed at the University of UPEC in Paris, actually, and we have a collaboration with them to work on the control of this exoskeleton. So it's uh, kinematics is represented here, as you can see here, the leg of the human, the wheel, and how the exoskeleton is fixed on the knee. So it is very simple. It's simple since it has just one degree of freedom, just this rotation of the knee to be controlled. It has a motor, and if this is its actuation system, the motor he is here, and you can see the transformation using cables of this rotation of the, of the motor to a rotation of the degree of freedom in the knee. Uh, this is just a view of the hardware of this exoskeleton here, as you can see, it's the mechanical structure with the actuators and the sensors uh, on board. You have here the singular, singular conditioning and the space board is for the hardware for controlling this exoskeleton. Now, typical applications where we can use this exoskeleton, as I can said before, we can use it for uh, different applications for rehabilitation, for instance. Here I just show two examples. The example of the task sit to stand, this is for elderly persons, a person which is sight like that, want to get to the upright position, and uh, he has not enough muscles to this motion, an elderly person. So that's what we, what we can do, we can ask to the, wear, the human to wear this, we can also use the EMG sensors to measure the, 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 the activity of the muscles of the human, to see how much we need to complete this uh, torque or this effort developed by the human to help him to do this task going from seat to stand. Another example of application of using this exoskeleton is the, the rehabilitation. And as you can see here on these pictures, so it's the task of flexion extension. So this doing just this motion and repeat it for the rehabilitation of the leg of the human. The second exoskeleton, it's also at the same university and we work together with them on control of this uh, exoskeleton. Erwa, so exoskeleton robotics are totally for walking assistance. So this is the exoskeleton and it is an exoskeleton for the lower limbs and not only one degree of freedom. So we have two, we have the knee, we have the knee, the, the knee and the hip for the first leg and the second also. So it is equipped for by four motors that actuate the four degrees of freedom for the legs of the human. Actually, so we have developed different controllers that we try to test on these two prototypes, and mainly uh, they are, we go from simple controllers to the most advanced controllers like the sliding mode control or the adaptive control, and we apply them for different uh, scenarios. So actually for the rehabilitation, I have just to mention that there is three kinds of rehabilitation. Let me explain. So we have passive rehabilitation, assistance as needed, and resistive rehabilitation. What is each one. So the first one, passive rehabilitation, is the following. Imagine that you have a problem with your leg, and you, you didn't move your leg during six months. The problem will be, what will be the problem? You, the problem will be in your muscles. Since you have not moved your leg during three or four or five months, you will have a problem, you will lose these muscles. So you have to strengthen the muscles of your leg. How we can do it? The first step, we can do the passive rehabilitation, so we asked the user to, to, work, to wear this exoskeleton, and we didn't ask the human to develop any effort. Just wear it, and the exoskeleton will develop all, the, all this effort to do this periodic motion to help the human to strengthen his muscles. Now, if this one is not enough, what we can do? We can do what we call the resistive rehabilitation, the third one. What is the resistive rehabilitation? If you want to strengthen more the muscles of the leg, 
You ask the human to do a motion in one direction, and you ask the exoskeleton to go to the other direction, to resist, such that the human will develop more, more, more torque or more effort. This will strain more the legs of the human, or any member of the, of the body. And the second one, assistance as needed. This is the typical example of elderly persons. So for instance, for seat to stand, uh, we can measure through the EMG sensors the, act, the, the muscle activity of the human, of the elderly person. And we notice that he has not enough effort, not enough torque to do this motion. What we can do, we can have an estimation of what the human can develop and what he needs to do the motion correctly. And we complete. We complete this effort developed by human by the actuator. This is what we call the assistance as needed. So we complete the need uh, of, the, of the effort in the human motion. And here, as you can see, different applications, rehabilitation, and also seat to stand. Let me now show you just uh, some few results, simulation results, and uh, the last one will be experimental results on this exoskeleton of one degree of freedom. So in, we implemented different controllers, as you can see here. We have implemented the PID controller, the nonlinear adaptive controller, inverse dynamics controller, backstepping controller, sliding mode controller, right controller. And the, the desired trajectory for this scenario is the red one, this continuous red one. So it's just a, a simple scenario of flexion extension. So repeat this motion and we try to go, uh, I mean to control the exoskeleton to follow this desired trajectory. So if we look to the different controllers, we can see uh, the difference between them, and we can see also the best one. For instance, here, uh, the rise controller, which is the, the, the blue, the, 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 not the dark blue, the other blue, which, is, which, which converges fast. It has not an overshoot here, and it's going very fast, and it is very stable. So it is here, for instance, is the best one. Uh, the first picture here, it represents the evolution of the angle of the knee, and the second one, it's the speed. Because we can measure, we have an encoder, we can measure the angle of the knee and also we can estimate the speed of the knee, we can compute it and here is the evolution. And here for instance, it's the control input. This is the torque needed to generate this motion by the different controllers and as you can see also, the rise controller is the best one. We have tried also other kind of trajectories. This case, in this case, we'll do this flexion extension in a continuous way, so we have to follow a reference strategy which is sinusoidal in this case. So we have the position and the speed of the knee angle for the different controllers also. And as you can see, the, the rise control is the best one. Now here we can show the tracking errors of these reference trajectories, as you can see here, and the torques generated by the controllers. If we see the tracking errors, so the, the yellow and the blue one are the best one. So the yellow is the backstepping controller and the blue uh, it's the rise controller. These are the mo best controllers. Now we have tried another thing. We have tried, since the uh, exoskeleton will be used by human, we suppose that we don't know the human. So it can be a person with 70 kilograms of weight, and this can be a person with 100 kilograms of weight. So we suppose that we don't know the leg of the human, such that we will keep the same controller, or if you want, for instance, to use the same exoskeleton on a population. The population has not exactly the same weight and the same inertia and so on. So we had to, uh, to, to see the robustness of the controller with respect to some parameters. So this is what we did, and here is the results for different controllers. We tried to introduce the error here, uh, uncertainty on the parameters, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%. It means that the controller thinks that the parameter is equal to one value, but when we apply the control action, we apply it to another model which has a value modified by this value. So up to 80% of an error, of the uncertainty. And as you can see here, for the PID, the error is here, the tracking errors between minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 for the different situations, and going from 0 to 80%. If we see the other controllers, for instance, the uh, adaptive controller here, as you can see, look, this is minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and here it's much smaller. So this control is be better than the previous one. And for the sliding mode controller, here as you can see the error, it's between minus 001, and minus, uh, yes, minus 005, for instance, to 002, to 02. So the error is also better than the previous case. And now let me show you uh, 
just one scenario of the real-time experiments of uh, some of this controller, it was the L1 adaptive controller, on our exoskeleton and to see how it works for the rehabilitation. So this is the video that we made on this exoskeleton of the knee, and here you will see three scenarios of working. So in the first scenario, it's the case of the locked knee, so we lock the knee and then we release and we can see here how it works, how it goes back to the initial position. And actually we made this experiment on the students who make this work. So it was a master student who tested this concept, did what he has developed on himself. So he wear the exoskeleton and he tried to do this scenario. So this is the first scenario. Then we have tried two other scenarios. Actually we have tried the flexion extension of the knee. So we have two positions, we have to switch between two positions. As you can see, we arrive to the final position, we stay, and then we go back to the previous position, so of the uh, flexion extension. And we repeat this scenario, and actually we are controlling the exoskeleton while wearing, uh, to be, while to be worn by the human. And the third scenario is the tracking of a continuous <coughs> signal. So for rehabilitation, sometimes we need to repeat this motion in a continuous way, so we, ju just, we have just to change the reference trajectory and to put a sinusoidal trajectory which is continuous and we try to uh, apply the controller and here as you can see the results of the performance of this controller. So actually, so this is the, the most important results that I can show you now. We are now actually working on the other exoskeleton for the lower limbs, for the two legs, so it's more difficult, more challenging, but we are carrying on and are working on this exoskeleton. Now let me go to the conclusion of this lecture. Today, so uh, for this last lecture, I tried to talk about uh, one subject which is very important, is the problem of control of exoskeletons. So as I have introduced at the beginning that the control of this waiver robotic device is very important, so we have to design the mechanical structure, but we have also to, to design controller to be able to do the task. And we have seen that these exoskeletons are mechanical frames designed to be worn by the human. So it, we have to pay attention about the security, about the powerful, about the application, about many things to be able to apply, uh, this, uh, to use these exoskeletons on the human. And we have seen that we have mainly four applications of using of these exoskeletons. We have the civilian application, we have the application for work or industry, we have the medical applications and also we have the military applications. And originally, the exoskeletons were, de were de developed for military applications first. So to deal with this control problem of this kind of systems for these uh, applications, we have to deal with these complex structures, we have to deal with the high number of degrees of freedom, the interaction with the wearer, there is an interaction between the, these uh, frames, these mechanical frames, and the human, you have to pay attention about this, and also, one thing which is very important is the security aspects, since we will use them on humans. So we have developed different controllers, going from the very simple controls of PID controllers to the most uh, advanced controllers, and we have validated them for, uh, for different situations in simulation, and I have tried to show you one scenario with real-time experiments for rehabilitation tasks. So by this, I give end to my presentation, I give you just as the previous lecture, some information. If you are interested to read the papers in detail about what we developed regarding these applications and others, you can download them on ResearchGate. If you are interested to see more videos, you have just to go to this YouTube channel. And I finish the presentation, and thank you very much for your time. Sorry? What is the power that needs the exoskeleton? The power that needs the exoskeleton? It depends on the application. So it depends first if you use the exoskeleton for lower limbs or upper limbs first. And then it depends the application, what you want to do. If you want to do passive, for instance, rehabilitation, you have just to measure the weights of the leg and to have an estimation about the power that you need, I mean, about the torque that you need to do the, this rehabilitation. From this value of the torque, you can deduce what is the power of the motor that you have to put on the exoskeleton. But to be sure uh, that your exoskeleton can be used for different situations, you can take the, the, the situation where you use the most big value of the power 
and you, you design your existence in depending on this. For instance, for the arm, you need less than for the leg. For instance, in, in the ankle, you need more than the knee, and so on. For instance, in the arm here, you need less than the legs, the lower limbs, and for the hand, you need, all, you need also less. So it depends on the application where you want to use your exoskeleton. Um, for example, um, ankle. Ankle, yes. Ankle, it's a very critical point or very critical joint. You know why? Because all the, the body weights have been to move by the ankle. So now, also, we have to pay attention. It depends also, as I said, for the application. If the ankle, you want to do uh, the motion like that, you don't need a very big power. But if you want to do walking, yes, for walking, you need a big power since you have to move the body uh, mass and inertia using this ankle. So it depends on the human also that you use the exoskeleton. What is the weight? What is the inertia of the helm? And then you compute the needed necessary uh, torque that you should be developed here, and consequently the motor that will be able to develop this power. Okay. Other questions, or remarks, or comments? The floor is open for you. Yes, please. Medical, for medical application. There is someone? Very nice question. This is a very technical question, and also it's very nice to learn about this. Uh, the problem, I think, is coming from the friction. Because in the knee here, we have a friction. The designed model, the design, or the used model for the controller, it was including the friction, but we didn't identify the parameters of this friction. So if you have a friction, you want to move, for instance, the problem is how to stop the motion because the friction will, uh, will, will be against you to do this motion. When you move, you move properly. And the inverse also, when you want to stop, when you stop, you can have this motion, this vibration. So, for sure, this is it's not very important, but it's, it can be a problem for some, some situations. And we can do the estimation of the parameters of the friction and compensate it in the control. But it's very nice remark, Kevin. You can see it. It's, other questions or remarks <coughs> or comments? Yes, please. How do you design the trajectories for the rehabilitation track? Do you use the motion capture or a doctor tells you how to ah, the yes. trajectory? Yes. So very nice question also. So how we, de we design the trajectories for the rehabilitation? So it's a very good question. So first, first of all, for these tests, we didn't uh, use any, I mean, basics from doctor or no. The only thing is that for the flexion extension, we have just, uh, oh, sorry, I will repeat the video. We have just tried to do a motion between two positions. We have just to pay attention that these two positions within are within the workspace of this uh, angle motion, and then, we have to uh, track this reference circuit. So the choose here, we have just to choose motion. We don't know if this is good for rehabilitation or no, or it's enough or not. So I, I think this is the doctor who will define this. I mean, we can give him the system. We tell him he can, we can use this system for rehabilitation. And the doctor can propose, yes, for flexion extension, let's put the value between 45 degrees and 70 degrees. And he enter these values in the, in the system, and the system will try to generate and follow trajectories. So actually, we didn't, uh, we didn't use this in, this in this video or this experiment. It's just to validate the concept that we can do rehabilitation. Now, whatever the value, we have just to pay attention that it's, we, uh, for instance, this is the maximum value, and the other value is 90, just to pay attention that it's within. Otherwise, it's just classical sinusoidal uh, trajectories or square trajectories.
Any other questions? Before I leave? Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. The Polytechnic University of Tolantico grants the following acknowledgement to PhD Amel Chamori for have given the lecture Advanced Control of Wearable Robotic Exoskeleton in the framework of the State International Research Congress from the UPT, Tolantico de Bravo, February 16, 2018, Arturo Gil Borja, Rector. Universidad Politécnica de Tulancingo. Líderes construyendo su futuro.